Um, and for those of you still coming in, uh, there are some row closed signs here that uh, you can feel free to move if you have a larger group than what fits in that row of four or three people. And so have, as per your own faith, you can distance. And uh, um, so I'm just going to read a scripture here uh, that speaks a little bit to our situation this morning. And uh, it's from Romans 14, and it's kind of about what to do when people disagree. How about that? And uh, so Romans 14 says, accept other believers who are weak in the faith. Now, it's kind of like from your perspective, they're weak. But from their perspective, you're weak, right? Okay, so accept the others, other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it is right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive, sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. Or those who wear masks must not look down on those who don't. Or those who watch from home must not look down. Or those from here must not look down on those who watch from home. So it's all good. God is here. He is protecting us. And uh, just that, the verse 4 there, Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Amen. So just to have everyone just to relax and breathe, whether you're at home, whether you're here. And uh, we are making some adjustments in light of our uh, current situation. We have, there will be no children. Uh, most of you know already, there's no children's classes. If you're visiting, there's no classes for children this morning. The gym is closed for the entirety of the day, not open after the service. We will have no coffee break. I apologize, you could have brought your own coffee. You should have noticed that online. As well, we're not going to be passing the offering buckets. There's The offering buckets are at stations around the room here, or you can continue to give online as you have in the past. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, sanitation stations around here and masks for anyone who uh, is, it, uh, feels like that's the right thing for them to do this morning. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you that we can gather here in this room, at home, other states, other nations, we can gather and bring glory to you. Lord, we anticipate what you're going to do in our midst as a community of believers. As we worship, as we hear, as we receive our individual assignments from you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Team? Good morning. Welcome back. I just want to pray that um, any heaviness would be broken off this morning. Yes. That um, we wouldn't think of the things of this world, but that we can be fully engaged in your presence this morning, Jesus.
encouraging me to stay every Jesus, Jesus. 
hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, great I am, who is worthy.
Lord, we worship you as the one who was and is and is to come. We declare your goodness and we declare your kingship. And we are so happy to be a part of this coming kingdom and be a part of this kingdom to serve our king in Jesus' name. We want this morning, we wanted to take the time of offering and tithes as a part of our worship. Uh, so we're going to continue to worship, but uh, here in the room we have uh, the offering buckets are literally all the way around the room. Uh, so I encourage you as we go back into this song, if you want to bring your tithes and offerings here, or we have the information as well for those many, obviously many and many of you have been giving online and mailing in and, and so forth. And so, yeah, there it is. So, uh, so online you can give newportchurch.net. Uh, of course, there's the, through the church app, and you can text. Uh, so for those of you online, you have the opportunity to see that. And uh, so let's give as a part of our worship this morning. So feel free to come and give online and uh, acknowledge His goodness as we sing. I want to be near to your heart. Thanks, Lauren and team. We'll, bravo. We'll be, team will be back later on. Uh, we want to just take a moment now to give a shout out to those of you who are graduating from high school and college. We want to say bless you and amen. I know the youth group has an extravagant celebration plan for those who are graduating from high school and uh, but in the way this is unfolding with your graduations this year, just know that your accomplishments are not going unnoticed. God notices, we notice the call of God and the completion, everything that you've been honorable to complete. So bless you in that. Also, this, um, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, for me personally... Um, I don't know of any family members who died in foreign wars, um, and so Memorial Days have kind of come and gone, and I got that, and I saw the wreath, and I saw the parades, but this year especially, there's, like most of the parades are canceled, and we're not, you know, doing the little celebrations and speeches and so forth, but, but 
on one Memorial Day a few years ago, I heard something that really changed my perspective on Memorial Day. And the, the, the concept is they died so that we could live and enjoy freedom. So the best thing that we could do is enjoy the freedom. And that means, like, choose the job of your choice, choose the wife or husband of your choice, like, just live and enjoy the freedom that these men and women died so that we could have. And that's, I mean, it's great to do a wreath, and we'll still be doing that, and parades, and that'll still go on. But the best way we can honor those who died is live and enjoy freedom. And ultimately, with the gospel, we know that Jesus died and resurrected. What's the best way that we can honor his sacrifice is to live and enjoy the freedom that he brings into our lives. So, amen. So, blessings on the weekend, and enjoy your family as you're together. And I think we're going into Newport News. Pastor Allen's last day before he moves into chaplaincy is May 31st. The blessing and commissioning we've planned for the Dices will be live streamed as part of our Sunday morning service that day. Due to the impact of coronavirus, the fellowship meal we had planned will be canceled. Since we can't be all together to honor and appreciate the Dice family, we would like to invite you to participate in a blessing parade following the service on May 31st. Plan to meet at the Newport Church parking lot between 1 and 1.30 p.m. We will have volunteers directing traffic and cars will be sent in groups of 10 to drive by the Dice's home. We will have a drop-off location at the end of their driveway for cards and gifts. Families are encouraged to travel in one vehicle if possible, as well as to anticipate a wait time. This event is rain or shine. We will be sending out more details about the Blessing Parade by email in order to keep some things a surprise. So please be on the lookout for that or contact the church office for details. Hi Newport Church. As many of you may already know, we are looking to add to our pastoral team. At the end of this month, Pastor Allen is moving on into chaplaincy. And so we're looking to add two new roles to our pastoral staff, one being an executive administrative pastor and the other being a community life pastor. If you have any recommendations of people in the church or in WSA that you might know, we would appreciate you passing this information along to them or giving us their details, which we can reach out to them. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. So good to have you with us this morning. You're all looking great with your corona hair. I've been shooting some videos over the last couple of weeks, and it's been like a chronology of my hair growth, you know? <laughs> so, good, so good to have you online. Those of you who are joining us online, awesome to have you with us. As a part of like the Newport family, extended family, wherever you are, God bless you. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is with you online. So good to have you all here. And man, it's awesome to worship together, isn't it? Come on. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Amen. Um, man, as we go on in our series here about church life, we started with the birth of the church and now we're going on into church life. We, uh, I want to kind of just take a step back into Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 2. You can also follow along. The notes for this sermon are in the church app. You can follow along with me there and fill in the blanks there in the church app if you have that. And it's awesome to be able to just to be here together. I just, man, this is so good. So um, many times when we look back in the Bible, when we look back over the, the stories that we know so well in Scripture, we can tend to view it with almost like some rose-colored glasses. We can tend like, oh, because we already know the outcome, right? We already know that like, okay, that person was going to get healed. That person was going to, you know, uh, go through a deliverance. That person, you know, maybe was, was going to die, you know. But they, we, we see it from the, the perspective of knowing the outcome. But, but they didn't. You have to understand, and this is what I think. I think that, every, that their walk of faith in Scripture is a lot like our walk of faith 
in real life. Like real life for them was, is very similar to real life for us, where like they had to overcome fear. They had to overcome insecurity. They had to overcome financial challenges. They had to overcome, you know, just different scenarios in their life that they were required to stand in faith, walk in faith, live in faith with the Lord. And that was their life as well. And so, you know, let us remember that as we look back and we look at some of the history of the church and the birth of the church and, and what does church life really mean, you know, their, their life was not so different than ours. I mean, maybe they were persecuted a lot more, you know, than, than we are in our generation. Um, but their life, you know, their, their everyday life, what they had to apply out of their faith and their relationship and their walk with the Lord, that was you know, very similar to where we find ourselves today, I believe. And so we can pull from that. Their, their life and experiences, you know, they, they had to, they had to uh, uh, wrestle with how do we relate to our neighbors? How do we relate to those around us? How do we relate to those who might disagree with us? You know, how do we relate to, to people like that? How do we share the gospel in that kind of environment? How, th- that, was their, that was some of the things that they were challenged with in the early church in Acts chapter 2. I mean, you had in Acts chapter 2 and 4 and the whole way through the book of Acts, we see that there was religious leaders that were coming against the church. Uh, there, there was political leaders that were coming against the church. And, you know, that was their life. They had to figure this out. But the gospel thrived. Tell your neighbor, the gospel thrives. Amen. So even in the environment of COVID-19, coronavirus, all of that, I want to tell you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is thriving. Amen? All right, so for all of you here in this room and for all of you online, like the gospel is getting outside of the four walls of this church broader than we, when, than we can uh, even understand. Like we see the scope of people logging in. We see the scope of people watching. And, and there's, there's, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the influence that God has given Newport Church is growing even online. And so we appreciate that. We don't take that lightly. We're serious about that. And we recognize that Jesus is moving in this day and age even in the face of what looks like obstacles. Amen? Even in the face of what looks like challenges, in fact, the gospel grows even greater and even better sometimes in those types of environments. Yeah? And so I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. So as we continue to look at the New Testament church, the example of what is church life really like, uh, Acts chapter 2 is where we kind of left off last week, and I want, to, I want to start there. Acts 2, 42 to 47, verse 42 says this. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And it goes on there down to verse 47. But we see that these four things is what the church devoted themselves to. Number one, apostolic doctrine, like the the teaching of the apostles, the teaching of those who had walked with Jesus, those who wrote, uh, you know, what what later became the New Testament of the Bible. They they dedicated, they devoted themselves to that. And so there's lots of things to be devoted to in life, but in this scenario, my charge, my challenge, my my, uh, heart is that we would be devoted to apostolic doctrine, to the fellowship as well, the apostolic fellowship, fellowship with a purpose, fellowship with a purpose that we gather together. and, and, And then, of course, eating together. Come on, that was a good place to say amen. Eating together. <laughs> you know, being dedicated to eat together. So that, that kind of life on life. And of course, we, that also is a part of communion as well, breaking bread and, and taking bread and wine together. But like that, that is church life. And then prayer, being dedicated to pray to each other, being de- uh, not to each other, with each other being dedicated to pray with each other uh, as we gather together. And it really, it's coming back to, you know, um, in September, we're going to be launching some new life groups. We're going to be launching like this whole kind of, uh, not really a reset, but just like this this thing, this new uh, initiative in life groups coming up in September. But really, the bedrock and the foundation of a successful life group is not just the content that you put into it, not just the leader of the group. The, the, a successful life group has to, 
comes down to the elements of just be having a one-on-one personal ministry mentality. That like, hey, if you're going through something, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to talk about it. We can talk about the Eagles winning the Super Bowl again in Jesus' name. You know, <laughs> yes, come on. We can talk about, you know, sports And then we can talk about the challenge that might be going on in your life or a testimony of what God is doing. And that's just part of normal life. And some of you, you know, many of you do this so well already. But that's the core of the Christian life, of the Christian experience. And that's the core of a successful life group is the the mentality of being a minister. So this morning, this is the, the title of this sermon is You Are a Minister. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say, you are a minister. That's right. You are. You are a minister. You might, you, you might not feel like you're a minister. I, I don't feel like I'm a minister <laughs> all the time. But we are. We are vessels that God can use to reach our generation, to reach our family, to reach our friends. In Acts chapter 4, Verse 23 to 31, I want to read through this because this kind of, you know, we, we, can, see, we can read through Acts and we can see all like the sensational parts, the, the miraculous parts, right? But sometimes we can miss the backdrop of what life looked like for the church. And so I want to, I want to read it with that in mind. Verse 23, when they were released, so this is Peter and John, when they were in prison, uh, they were in prison for, for preaching And it says, when they were released, where did they go? They went to their friends. They went to their friends. All right? It doesn't say they went to their church members. It doesn't say that they, you know, went to their their club or their, you you know, it says they went to their friends. And they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them, verse 24, and when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of, your, of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot vain? Plot in vain, excuse me. Verse 26, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Wow, that's a concept right there. All right, verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So Paul, uh, sorry, Peter and John, they come back to their friends and they tell them, what do they do? They kind of, they, they testify. They give a testimony. They say, hey, this is what happened. This is what God has done. This is what the threats are. This is what happened to me. They give like this testimony, this report to their friends. And what is the, what is the immediate response is that there's this proclamation that rises up out of this group of people that are gathered together saying, Lord, and they start to pray. And it's, but it's not like this, this, this like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that. It's not this wimpy prayer of like, oh, Lord, we're so, we're so beat down. Please help us. You know, and, and listen, I've been in, in, in scenarios in my life where I've prayed like that because that's all I could get out, all right? <laughs> you know? But like, it was this proclamation, this declaration God, you reign. You created the heavens and the earth. Even, even David, our father David, proclaimed and declared your lordship and your kingship. And, and though the Gentiles rage and though uh, the, the leaders have gathered together against your name. They're only doing what you had predetermined for them to do in the first place. So God, look on their threats and give us boldness. Give us boldness. That was what happened. That was, that was the environment 
of their friends. That was the environment of the friends. That immediately out of testimony, there was this, this I, I don't know about you, but I just, I just sensed like this roar of God. You reign. God, you rule. God, we welcome you in this city. God, you're doing what, what you know you've planned already. They're just playing into your hand. God, we're here for you. God, give us boldness. Give, uh, let us preach the gospel. Let us preach the word of God. And this response out of them, that was the life of the church. That is the life of the church today. So they went to their friends, they testified, they told them what happened, and together they began to pray and declare the rule of God over their community. They proclaimed and prayed scriptures together. That's what they did. They went back and they saw, hey, David said this, David prophesied this, that, we're, we're going to pull that forward into today. <laughs> Amen? They were praying scripture. They were proclaiming scripture together. Coming into unity of that. It's interesting that um, uh, Shri and I were talking about Pentecost. So next Sunday is Pentecost. And obviously it's, it's also, uh, it, before it was a Christian holiday, uh, signifying the Holy Spirit coming, right? It was a Hebrew holiday. And the night before Pentecost, they the Jewish people would stay up all night and they would study the scriptures all night long. They would get into the word because for them, it was, it was the marking of God coming to the Israel people uh, with Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. And it was like the wedding covenant where God was, that's what happened at Mount Sinai when the Israelites became the people of God is there was this wedding covenant that God, that was the law of Moses. There was like this wedding covenant. And so they, they were, the Jews would get together all night and they would study the, the, the agreement of the covenant, the wedding covenant that they have entered into with God. And so that's why the, the disciples were all together. And they were in this place of seeking the Lord together, of prayer and going, oh, pulling scripture back, you know, looking back, God, what are you saying? What, what are the promises that you have for me? What are the promises that you have for our, our region, our nation, our family? God, let it happen in our generation. Listen, the word of the Lord, I, I just want to tell you, this is my belief. Uh, the word of the Lord, it's going to come to pass, but it's up to us whether or not it comes to pass in our generation. Amen. It's going to come to pass, but we can pull it into our generation, I believe. It's, it's you know, so that, that part is up to us. And so this is what they were doing. They were gathering together, all right? And uh, why did I get on Pentecost? Because it's next Sunday. That's why I got on Pentecost. It's next Sunday where we celebrate Pentecost. Now the Holy Spirit's already here, amen? All right? But uh, we, you know, we celebrate the coming and the gathering together. But this is what happens when we gather together, and that's what that means in one accord, where we're, we're, we're pulling for the will of God. We're, we're going over Scripture. We're, we're pondering the Word of God, the promises of God in our hearts as we gather together. And the Holy Spirit, man, that's like, that's like a big, wide landing strip for the Holy Spirit to come and land in our lives. All right, so the, the activity of the early church there were... Peter and John, they come back, and they tell their friends what was going on. They tell their friends, and what, what's the response? They pull Scripture into their generation. They pull the promises of God into their generations. They start to declare it. They start to proclaim it, and they prayed the Scriptures together, and they appealed to God to look upon threats and grant Boldness, And what was the result? In verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were fill, all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's the result, is speaking the word of God with boldness. Amen? So that, that's, that's the result. And this isn't the first time that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was kind of like a topping up. I don't know. Anyone ever need a topping up of the Holy Spirit? I, I don't know. I do. <laughs> yeah. All right. I do. Uh, you know, you just get topped up. And so, but this is, see the, do you see the backdrop of the relational aspect of Christianity there? Relational Christianity. That's what 
that's, that's like the underground part of the church that Larry Kreider talks about. It's this relational Christianity, the, 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 the understanding that we're all ministers and we all bring a part. And so if you, if you remember the sermon we did last week, you know, where, where we talked about the different parts that people bring together and they build, they see the, the, the will of God built in their midst, all right? Several weeks ago, we spoke about the, how the early church had grown, and there was a couple like big events, but most of it was along relational lines. The church grew along relational lines, amen? It was along relational lines where family members came, friends came, work associates came to be a part of the church. There was a couple big events where like a couple thousand people you know, came at, into the church, but most of it was this daily relational Christianity that's going one to another, life on life, sharing the gospel and sharing the goodness of God. And I personally believe that like <clears throat> large meeting type Christian events like Sunday mornings, listen, they are important. They're important. But it's only it's only like 15 to 30 <laughs> percent of what Christian life is supposed to be. Right? So, like, this isn't the all in all of the Christian experience. This is, you know, this is, this is like, yay, we get together and we can celebrate and we can, you know, enjoy like a corporate anointing and God moving in our midst and worshiping together. Like, you don't get that in life groups. You don't get that by yourself at home. But there's also things you don't get, you know, here that you get at home, that you get in life groups. Amen. All right, so, so these meetings are important, but it's only like 15 to 30 percent, my, my opinion, you know, of what Christian life should be about. You can be like, well, Merle, you're preaching against the church. No, I'm not. It, it's important. Tell your neighbor, say, it's important. All right, it's, it's, it's vital. It's important. All right, because this, you know, larger meetings feed into quality life and life groups, and, you know, that it feeds into that. But but it's, it's not the all-in-all all of Christian experience. It's not the all-in-all all of Christian experience. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, right? I know that, like, you guys all know this and you, you all experience this already. But, like, much of the early church related upon the basis of the culture that they were in. So in Jewish culture, the center of Jewish culture of that time was, like, the temple or synagogue. And then there was the home, like the, every, the, the Shabbat, you know, the Sabbath. Every, every Friday night, they would gather, you know, and it was the home. There was this place where home was a center, a cultural center for them. And then the temple or the synagogue was a cultural center for them to gather around. And then there was the marketplace where they would buy and sell. And, and, and those were kind of the three pillars of Jewish culture. Today, it's, it's not that different than what we have today. We have our homes, right? And we have our jobs, the marketplace. And then see, Starbucks built their whole brand on this, calling themselves the third place. They recognize that people need a third place, that it's not just enough for people to gather in their homes. It's not just enough for people to gather at work. They need a third place. And so they are happy that everyone can come into their shop and buy a $5 cup of coffee and sit there and get online and get on the internet. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's the whole marketing strategy behind that. Listen, I have, I don't know, I have faith that our church and our families in terms of uh, our, our houses can be people's third place that we gather, can be the third place for people. So I don't know, I just have that faith, all right, that our communities, including online ministry, you know, because that's, that, uh, that in our culture is also becoming a third place, online, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, <laughs> right, you know? It's, it's, it's the third place that people relate, that people connect. And I, it, I mean, after the whole, the whole coronavirus thing, you know, people might not want to connect through a screen, but I think it's here to stay, you know? <laughs> like, I know so I've talked to a lot of people who are like, we are just so over Zoom, <laughs> you know, like, forget it, <laughs> you know? 
But, I, you know, I, but there's, there's this place where it is, it is a third place. And so we are treating it as, as a legitimate, full-on ministry arm of Newport Church because for people, this is life-sustaining for them, a life-giving for people. Amen? If you're online, you can preach with me and say amen. All right. So, but I have vision that our homes become this third place that nurtures souls. That nurtures souls. That's, that's, the, that's the term that Starbucks uses. That they're, they want their stores to nurture souls. Like, come on, they're a secular company. Come on, where's the church? Come on, where's the church in this? This is, I mean, that's our, that's our language. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's our language, right? All right, so, and we understand, too, that COVID-19 is forcing society to rethink personal relationships. Where before, you know, people were just hammered down, going, 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 going. All of a sudden, people are starting to revalue and rethink the value of connection. And what does connection look like? Listen, guys, this is our moment. As the church, the world is hurting. The world is scared. They might want you to wear a mask to speak to them. That's okay. I'll wear a mask to speak to to anybody about Jesus, to pray for anybody. Amen? Listen, the world is scared. This is our greatest moment. It can be. It can be our greatest moment as the world is hurting and scared right now. This is the time for one-to-one ministry. This is the time for one-to-one ministry. I mean, we're going full bore, full on ahead with, you know, these meetings and online stuff and, you know, material, all that. But, like, all of that can, can, can come to nothing if, if we don't each carry our flame, if we don't each carry our torch. The priesthood of all believers is God's heart, right? It's God's heart that each one of us are ministers, that each one of us are priests. We minister to the Lord and we minister to each other, all right? That was part of Martin Luther's like 95 thesis that he nailed to the door. And I think we're kind of in a pivotal time. Again, we're kind of, we we see this diaspora happening again in terms of the change of culture and the change of church life it's happening right now, and so God, give us the strategy, give us the wherewithal to be a part of what you're doing in this place. You see, and this is what I really want to preach to us about, so we can say yes, amen, personal one-to-one ministry, it's important. How many of you agree it's important? Yeah, all right, online. If you're on Facebook, give us a thumbs up, you know, give us a comment, amen, you know. Yeah, it's important. But I want to tell you that there's also a cost to personal ministry. There's a cost for ministry. You know, Peter and the other apostles in, in Acts several times were arrested. Now, I don't think anybody's, anyone's going to be arrested, right? I mean, there's some conspiracy theories out there saying that we're all going to be arrested. We're not, okay? <laughs> but there is a cost. There is a price to pay. There is a price to pay for personal ministry for to reach out to your neighbor. It might be the cost of laying down some pride. It might be the cost of getting over some awkwardness. It might be the cost of putting on a mask. It might be the cost of you fill in the blank. All right? Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter's response, Peter and the apostles' response after they were arrested, what was their response? They said, We must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. There's always been a personal risk to ministry. So from Peter being told by Jesus the way he would die to Acts 21 when uh, Agabus, the prophet, comes and takes Paul's belt and binds his hands with it and says, this is what's going to happen to the owner of this belt if you go to Jerusalem. And Paul says, I know, but I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to go anyway. There's always been personal cost 
to ministry. You know, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes this to the Romans who, who he had to become like in order to reach, right? We know that, right? He writes this, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Personal ministry has always had with it great cost. The Wycliffe Bible translators over a century ago who packed their belongings in coffins. Think about that. They packed their life belongings into a coffin when they went off to Africa because they had such a high chance of not returning. They had such a high chance of succumbing to cholera or dysentery or locals who took them for enemies. The gospel has always cost us something. Think about Nate Saint the missionary pilot who to reach interior Brazil, interior Amazon. It cost him his life. Just within the last decade, a missionary connected to our international family was taken out by a militant Islamic group in the Middle East. Some of you might know them, the family. So, I've been encouraged to share this with you, and I, I want to share this with a caveat, that this is my personal take, this is my personal commitment, and I cannot require this of anybody. Is that good? I need you to understand that. But this is my response to the coronavirus in regards to ministry. Maybe it's because of my missions background, uh, but I think it goes even beyond that because from a young age, from the age of like 10, 11, 12, I knew that there was a call for ministry on my life. And I had no clue what it would look like or where it would take me or anything like that. But I knew that there was a call of ministry. And I, I, from a young age, I've set my heart to be obedient as best as I could, as best as I knew how for that. And to position my life and posture my life, knowing that I would preach in different nations, go to different nations, go into missions. I've, I've had that call in my life for a long time. I responded to that call throughout various, like many of you who went on missions trips, I, uh, international missions trips, different places, but then also in the U.S., such as going to the Bronx and, and doing outreaches on the streets in the Bronx of New York City, going down to Mardi Gras, the party in New Orleans with Denny Nisley. I don't know if you guys, some of you might know Denny Nisley, you know, like like, I mean, just bold and brash. Like, I, I, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm there. My dad and I went, <laughs> you know. And we were, we were down on the streets, street witnessing in Mardi Gras. I, I think I, I forget how old I was. I was probably like, I don't know, 14, 15 years old doing that. Like, that was, and, and it was just, it was, that was my viewfinder of life. Later on, when we were married, traveling to different countries, preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even still today, I had to think about this, that like still today I choose to go into places where there are tropical diseases that can kill me. Last year I had malaria. Now, most times you recover from malaria, you know. But like I've also buried people. I've also had close friends who have had loved ones die from that. So what I'm about to say, I say understanding the risks involved. Placing my life in God's hands is not something I'm willing to reverse in my life because there's a risk. 
um, missional environments are always risky. It's just maybe for the first time the risk in America has gone up. But that decision to go was a decision that's been made for me a long time ago. So please hear me out, but that the posture for sacrifice for the sake of ministry that I have for the Lord, I, I can't require that of anybody else. That's between you and the Lord, okay? All right, that's between you and God, the posture for ministry, sacrifice. But I am not going to stop preaching the gospel. I'm not going to stop ministering one-to-one. I'm not going to stop sharing because there's a virus out there. All right? When you travel in in missions, like just because you go into, many times you go into places where even though there might be medical treatment here in the West, that treatment will not save you where you go. <laughs> you know? Like, it's, it would be too late many times. Um, so, I remember as in high school, we were in Honduras, and I don't know, I got some bug that, and I probably told you about it already, I got some bug that made me lose 20 pounds in three days. It was coming out both ends, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, and, and almost died. I mean, just literally, like just, anyway. Um, but this is the point. that I'm not going to allow the fear of a virus to cause me to pull my life off the altar, I'm not going to allow a fear of a virus to cause me to take my life out of God's hands and back into my own. I've decided, and, I, and you know, that um, I'm just not going to allow fear of a virus to stop me from ministering to people. In Revelation chapter 12, 11, it says that they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by their word of their testimony, and not loving their lives unto death. Right? So I'm not going to allow a fear of a virus to cause me to start loving my life more than obedience, than loving obedience to Jesus. This also does not mean I'm going to take stupid risks. <laughs> okay? Like, when you travel to other nations, I don't drink the water, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm not going to drink water out of a stream that other people drink water out of, just because that, to me, that's stupid, right? I'm not going to be like, oh, I have nothing to fear. Oh, give me some of that muddy water, <laughs> you know? Ah, I have something to prove. No, I'm, you know, there's a balance here, right? There's a balance here. But I, I don't say this, you know, I'm going to disinfect my hands, you know, I'll wear a mask or whatever if, if people want me to do so. But there's a, there's, a, um, there's a balance here. And I don't say what I say lightly because I've buried really good people. I've had memorial services for guys under the age of 33 who were powerful men of God. Who were powerful men of God. Who... Uh, one was a spiritual son. His name was Isaac Mosima Moloa. And he was a preacher, and he, he got typhoid and malaria and succumbed to it. I've also prayed for people, and they've gotten healed, right? You know, But this is the scope of Christian life. It's broader, I think, than we realize, that there's risks. There's risks, and we have to be okay with, with some of that. And there's no requirement, you know, no one can require a risk of you. That's between you and the Lord. But there, there are risks in life, you know, where we've, you know, I've, I've seen people healed of cancer, but yet I've, I've had memorial services for really powerful young men. Another guy, John Gila, an incredibly sweet guy, 
very, uh, it's very gentle in spirit, an amazing psalmist. I mean, he, he had this sound when he worshiped. He had this, this, this sound of like, it, it, was, it was something that you don't hear. Like a, a lot of people sound the same, right? <laughs> you know? But he had one of these unique voices and unique ability to lead worship. And one day after church, I gave him a hug, and he was like, man, you're, you're really hot. Like, you're, you've got a fever. You've got to get to the hospital. Like, what's, what's going on? And two days later, he was gone. We never found out why. We never found out why. I just got this call. John is dead. So the, I, I say what I say, understanding that risks are real. Understanding that risks are real. Nigel Ocker, some of you guys know him, is a spiritual son of mine. One of his good friends and spiritual sons contracted cerebral malaria and died in a week. So like those, we know, we know the, that God's power is present to heal. Amen. But we also understand that, that sometimes God might be okay with risks that we have to become okay with in the reality of, of our lives, okay? And so, I mean, I don't have a death wish, okay? I, I want to walk my, my daughters down the aisle just like anybody else, any other dad. You know, I want to walk, I want to be at my son's wedding just like any other parent, but I'm not going to allow the fear of a virus to shift my posture or place of sacrifice that I've spent my whole life doing my best to maintain before the Lord. All of our lives are in the hands of God. Our lives are in the hands of God. So <clears throat> I'm not going to allow the fear of a virus to, to cause me to take my life back into my own hands. Luke chapter 12, verse 25 says, And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life. This is Jesus' words. Which of you, by worrying or by being anxious, can add a single hour or a single day to your life? Now listen, the enemy is real. The devil tries to steal, kill, and destroy, okay? I'm not saying that everyone who dies, that it was their time. But, you know, there is a place where we don't open ourselves to be stolen from. I mean, everyone probably locks their doors <laughs> at some point, right? All right, we don't open ourselves, but yet we trust God with our lives. And so, uh, you know, I've determined in my heart that um, we're going to pray, we're going to minister, we're going to do whatever anyone is open to doing. Uh, me, I say we, I shouldn't say we there, me, <laughs> you know, and because the gospel is still true, even in this environment. The gospel is still true. And if God decides that a virus is what's going to bring me to him, I'm okay with that. The reason I'm okay with that is because I want to pursue what God has given me to do in my life, which is preach the gospel. It's something I've known for a long time in my life. Now, we don't want to be stupid, right? I don't want to be stupid, but there's, um, there's a place of saying, I embrace the risk of, we em I embrace the risk for the gospel. Listen, I, I don't really embrace this risk to like go see a movie, okay? Or go, the right to go sit at a restaurant, all right? But to preach the gospel? Yeah. Yeah. 1 Peter says this in verse 13 of chapter 3, uh, that, it's, that now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. In other words, don't 
suffer for stupidity's sake, <laughs> right? Make sure that you position yourself to be, if you have to be slandered, to be slandered for the right reasons, okay? Pay a price for the gospel, not for a political, not for a particular political view or the right to go to a restaurant, but be preaching the gospel, guys. Be preaching the gospel. We're ministers. We're ministers. So whatever, whatever degree or wh- wherever your obedience with the Lord takes you, preach the gospel. Share the life of Jesus Christ. Preach the gospel. Pay a price for the gospel. Don't get distracted by conspiracy theories. And listen, some of that stuff may be true. Some of it might not be. None of us has the grid. Can we just be honest and realize that none of us has, like, the perfect grid on that? But that's not worth giving your life for. That's not worth being slandered for. Let us sacrifice for the gospel. Preach the gospel. Let us commit ourselves to having a life of ministry. Whatever that looks like. It can be on Zoom. Whatever it is, that's fine. But, but let it be about the gospel. Worship team, can you come? Thank you. As the worship team is coming, perhaps it's a good time to, to sit and consider our lives before the Lord. That is our, what we doing, is what we're doing, the thing that God has put us on the earth to do. You know, I made a statement that, you know, our lives are in the, in the hands of God. Well, that's my hope. That's my prayer. That each one of us are living out of this place of obedience that I'm doing the very thing that God has put me on the earth to do. And so, therefore, I'm willing to risk and give all for it because it's a obedience to Jesus. Yeah? But if you're not, maybe it's time to reconsider and say, you know, maybe this time of COVID is a wake-up call to say, am I, you know, if, if we're all going to go out, well, let's go out doing what we were put here to do. <laughs> and we're not all going to go out. You have a very high chance of survival if you get anything, <laughs> okay? Especially in a Western medical system, <laughs> okay? All right. But, but, but you know, the, the, the point here is, are we doing, it, is our hands, is our life in the hands of God? Are we willing to sacrifice for what it is we're doing? We've always said and we've always had very many amens to the most the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> After this preaching, I don't know what I'm saying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's really true. So if God has called you to your job, listen, what I'm trying to communicate here, if God has called you to where you're at, you have no reason to fear. You have no reason to stand in anxiety or fear, okay? If God has called you where you are, it's time to trust his hands. If you're outside of, you know, if if you're going against where God has called you, you know, that's when maybe... It's a good time to take this week to reconsider our lives. But if, God is, if you are where God has called you to be, doing what God has called you to be, to be doing, we should have no reason to fear. As, as servants of the Most High God. So my encouragement this morning is, are you living in the purpose of God for your life? Are you doing what you've been created to do? Are you called to the job you're in, to the people you're working with? doesn't mean it's easy. God sends us into hard places sometimes. That's okay. But if you know that God has opened those doors, if you know that God has sent you there, then maybe this is like a missions trip where you embrace the risks of where God has sent you 
and you go for it, and you share the gospel, and you represent the kingdom of God, it's just that it's our community instead of a community somewhere else around the world. So let this time be a really good reality check for us. Say, God, you know, am I doing what you want me to do? Am, am I sacrificing for the right things? You know? And let's take time uh, just to consider that. What we want to do is we want to take time to, to um, just respond to the Lord out of that. So we'll stand and worship. But just go before God and, and pray and ask him to lead you. Amen? Just let's get in, in his presence. Uh, what we're going to do after that is we're going to come back. Leon and Rebecca Smucker are moving to Maryland this week. And so we want to, with sadness in our heart, we're going to bless you out. <laughs> okay? Uh, we'll do that. But let's take some time to respond to the Lord as the worship team leads us here uh, this morning. We can stand together. This is 
of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. In your app, you have a another set of notes there that says, Hope to Live By. And it's scriptures that talk about the hope of the Lord. I just want to read through them here, and then we're going to take time. Prayer ministers, you can come. And if you would like prayer for any reason, you're welcome to come and receive prayer. Uh, before we head into just that solo time of ministry, we're going to bless Leanne and Rebecca out. So if you guys want to prepare to come. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, Remember before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.18 says, Having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you are called, what, which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Hebrews 10.23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have towards you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to, to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Psalms 33, 18 and 19 says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Romans 15 verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Isaiah 43 verses 1 to 3 says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you, Lord, that today anxiety goes. In Jesus' name. Fear goes. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing that chorus just one more time, and then we're going to pray for you guys. All my life you have been Amen. Thank you for your goodness. So if you're watching online, we're going to continue to pray here. If you're watching online, we bless you and we say the Lord keep you and the Lord is moving in your life in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you to come to the Newport Church website. There's places you can send in prayer requests and contact the church and uh, we'll be happy to get back to you and, and give counsel and wisdom and prayer. And so bless you. We'll see you online as well and we're going to continue to pray here.